and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to welcome back to the show, Laura Vanderkam. She's been on the show since the very beginning of the show, six plus times now over the course of the past 10 years of this podcast. And this time she's back to talk about her brand new book, Tranquility by Tuesday, nine ways to calm the chaos and make time for what matters. And that's exactly what we do in this conversation is dig into what those nine ways are. I'm not going to give them all away. You've got to listen to the episode to dig in and find out what they are and really start to ponder them. But one of them, I think, is a game changer when it comes to habits. And I'll just spoil it right now, is that doing something three times a week is a habit. And here's the thing. Is it a habit because she says so? Or is it because I say so, or I agree with what she said, or because you agree with the two of us? No, it's because a habit is what you make it. A habit is not something that you do daily. A habit is not something that you do weekly. A habit is something that you say you do consistently according to whatever timetable it is you say you're going to do it by. And so thereby saying, I'm going to work out three times a week, or I'm going to do this other thing three times a week. Isn't it funny that we always go to the working out thing as like the habit? I think a lot of us have to get into that habit a little bit more. But anyway, point being, that is just one of the game changing air quotes rules that she talks about from her book in this conversation. So I'll just get out of the way and say, enjoy this conversation with Laura Vanderkam. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Laura Vanderkam. Welcome back to Beyond the To-Do List. Thank you so much for having me back again. I'm excited to be talking with your audience again. It's just a default. Every time somebody reached out and said, Laura's got a new book, I'm like, when? When is it? And when can she <laughs> oh, come that's on? So sweet of you. Yeah. And I, I was looking through, I thought, you're one of the ones who's been pretty consistent and you've been on the show five times now over the course of the past 10 years. There's a bonus one in there that's a short cast. It's about seven to 10 minutes which is a thing I partnered with with Blinkist and I put out in the feed to let people know about that. So, and then I started looking, wait, how many books is this? Cause I know the first time <laughs> I was kind of playing catch up and we kind of put what the most successful people do, almost all of them together in one episode. So let's see, let's list those off. What, what the most successful people do before breakfast at work on the weekend. Those are separate <laughs> books. Then you did 160 hours. You have more time than you think. And then. And this may not be in order as it gets later into it, but you did I Know How She Does It, which is basically based off of the 160 hours. And then somewhere in there is Juliet's School of Possibilities, all about priorities, which was great. You know, it's a break of the format. You did Off the Clock and the new corner office was one of the most recent ones because that's remote work and that was timely right when everybody else was forced to do that. So and now a brand new book. Tranquility by Tuesday, nine ways to calm the chaos and make time for what matters. And in fact, we're recording this on a Tuesday. We are. And I feel pretty (laughs) tranquil right now, though I feel a little rushed, but whatever. That's how it is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you for all all that. I mean, yes, it sounds like I guess we've talked about a lot of topics over the years, but always about how to, you know, make more time for what matters and spend less time on the things that don't. Yeah, I mean, if I sense a theme, you're always coming at it from time, but from a different aspect or perspective. It's matching task and desire and priorities and the shoulds with the how do we then treat that resource of time with the ability to then get that stuff done, the needs and the wants. We're always talking about time, always trying to figure out how to use the time we have, the 24 hours in a day, the 168 hours in a week, but always from a slightly different angle because, you know, I have readers who've read all my books and I don't want to bore them with a new one. So if I'm going to write something new and put the time into it and ask readers to spend the time reading it, I want to say something different. So I'd like to think that they all are, you know, approaching time from a slightly new perspective and that you'll learn something from any given title that you didn't from the others. Yeah. And I have the same problem. It's like, I've got to do a new show over and over and over again. Like I've got to do 52 shows a year. I've got to, that's probably not the way to frame that. I get to, you would like to, I I like to, I would like to, I get to, it's enjoyable for me, but like with most things, when you do it over and over and over again, you start to wonder, am I repeating myself? Is there something fresh and new here? Is it a new perspective or am I just rehashing? And I can say when you talk about the nine rules 
in this book, it's different and fresh and a new reframing. I don't want to say condensing or reusing, but it is in a certain sense. You're revisiting things you've already talked about, but it's modern. It's a new approach, in other words, overall. Yeah. So, I mean, for this book, what I did is, you know, I realized that people have sent me their schedules. Thousands of people have over the years. I've given a lot of time management advice. But when I think about it, a lot of that advice kind of fit into certain categories. And many times I was saying the same thing to people, even though people's lives are incredibly different. Much of the same advice was applying to everyone. So for this book, I honed my strategies down to nine particular rules that I think are broadly applicable, will help most people enjoy their time more, feeling like they are doing what matters, you know, spending less time on what doesn't matter. And again, because I write self-help for busy people, I want to make sure that these rules work. And so I had 150 people try them out over nine weeks. They would learn a rule, answer questions about how they plan to use it in their lives, answer questions a week later about how it went. I could measure them on various dimensions on a time satisfaction scale I developed and can tell you that if you follow the rules, the people who follow the rules for these nine weeks did in fact feel significantly better about their time at the end of it. Uh, So I'd like to think that that will work for any other readers as well. And that seems very reminiscent of not only the 168 hours book, but also the I know how she does it book, because you're bringing in all this real world data from real people who struggle with time management and their tasks and their to-do list and their calendar and their family and their work life? And what were some of the criteria that you had in terms of making sure that you got a good data set? Well, I opened it to anyone. Uh, Although if you find me, then, you know, you're probably interested already in, in productivity. You know, I collected demographic information. The majority of people were working full time more than 30 hours a week or so. The majority actually had children at home. So it was people who were in sort of the, the busy years, as I call them, where they're, they're building careers, raising families. And so, you know, people who are already getting a lot done, but in many cases want to feel better about their time. So not just like they're cramming more things in, but that they are actually enjoying the hours that they have. So, yeah, I, you know, open it up. So you just have to be willing to try these things out to open emails from me fairly regularly for the next two months or so. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who did the project really enjoyed it. At least that's what they told me, because the bulk of Tranquility by Tuesday is made up of their observations. So as I asked them questions about how they were using the rules in their lives, how it went, the challenges they faced, they were answering in, you know, broad detail that was able to become the stories on which the book is based. Now, you've got nine rules. I'm curious if when you were giving the homework out for all these people, if there were more in there that then you would figured out, you know what, that's not really a rule because enough people really had too much friction up against it. Did you throw any out? So it's interesting. I actually didn't. um, I did do a pilot version of the study, though. So before I had the 150 people do it, I did it with about 36 people, I think is the number, just to see, can I explain these rules well? If I ask these questions, do people know what I'm getting at? Or are any of these questions unclear? And by doing the study with a much smaller group first, I could iron out any of those things. Honestly, I had been working on this list of rules for a long time. So I had shown it to various people. I had put it through the rubric of like, does this sound right? You know, if I show it to people, what do you think of these? You know, doing time makeovers with people and they would generally choose from the list of things that they thought would be most helpful. So, you know, I I think nine is a lot. So it was more that I was making sure I wasn't so much cutting down from like 50. It was it was more like, can I get at most angles of life through this? So it sounds like you had kind of, uh, I don't want to say condensed, maybe a synthesizing kind of process over time that you realized, okay, this is my next thing. This is the next, not repurposing, but packaging approach, polishing. You got to this point of you had these rules and then you had your beta testers and They all seem to match up with, okay, they have similar life experience, life expectancy, and all of that as you do, which again, you've got five kids. So most people are like, oh, productivity experts, they can do whatever they want to and say whatever they want to, but then it doesn't really apply to life. No, your whole point is practical application to real life. Yeah. I mean, if something's not going to help in your real life, I'm not sure what's really the point of it. (laughs) So, So these nine rules are all incredibly 
practical. And sometimes there's a specificity to them that is, you know, that's what makes it practical. I mean, just as an example, one of the rules is one big adventure, one little adventure. And this is getting at the concept of making more memories, like doing things in life that will be memorable, that can change your experience of time. But obviously you could do like three adventures a week. I don't know. You could do four, you could do one, but this sort of one big adventure, you know, like half a weekend day and one little adventure taking less than an hour because it is so specific that leads to people feeling it as very practical. Like these are straightforward instructions. Like this is what you can do. And if you do this very specific thing, you will probably have this experience with it. So, you know, I I find that when people are going to adopt rules or suggestions for people who don't like the idea of rules, making them specific is often very helpful. I didn't want to give everything away in this conversation. Obviously, we want people to go check out the book. It is well worthwhile. It makes a lot of sense from a practical standpoint in terms of giving you clear, practical advice on what to do here. But you just mentioned one of the rules, which was one of the ones that I had earmarked that I want to dive into a little bit more. So I do want to do that. I do want to, however, maybe briskly mention all nine of them and just say, okay, these are the nine. And then here are three that we can dive into a little bit deeper. So, Well, I can list the nine um, and then you choose which three you want. Perfect. All right. So rule number one give yourself a bedtime. Rule number two, plan on Fridays. Rule number three, move by 3 p.m. Rule number four, three times a week is a habit. Rule number five, create a backup slot. Rule number six, one big adventure, one little adventure. Rule number seven, take one night for you. Rule number eight, batch the little things. Rule number nine, Effortful before effortless. So the three that stuck out to me, well, the one you already mentioned was number six, one big adventure, one little adventure. And essentially there you're talking about each week doing at least two things, one big, one little that are creating memories. Now, what does that have to do with time management? Wait a second. You're asking me to have a big adventure and a little adventure every week. How am I going to fit that in when I already feel like I don't have enough time? Yeah. So it turns out that time management isn't just about getting things off our plates. It's also about making sure that we are filling life with the good stuff. I mean, partly because when we do fill life with the good stuff, everything else naturally takes less time. I mean, you can try to come up with all the email hacks you want, but one way you know you're going to spend less time in your inbox is if you're out having wonderful adventures. So I I think that's a more proactive and fun approach to spending less time on things that we don't wish to be doing. But yeah, actually, you know, many of the rules are additive and I make no apologies for that. I think, you know, when we are trying to make the most of our time, we are better off putting cool stuff into our lives because that is going to crowd out the things that we don't want to do. And it's also going to crowd out a lot of that sort of low value puttering around time that even the busiest people tend to have. We just don't necessarily notice it because it's not noticeable time. It's not memorable time. And we want to be creating things that are noticeable, that we will remember, that our brains will hold on to, which which gets us to this idea of adventures. I mean, you know, I'm sure your listeners have noticed this. Much of adult life can be absolutely the same day to day. You know, you get up, you get ready, you get everyone else ready. If you have other people with you, you go to work, you work a full day, collect everyone at the end, you know, dinner, get kids off to bed or you know, do your chores, watch TV, go to sleep, do it all over again, right? And there's nothing wrong with routines because routines make good choices automatic. But too much of the sameness stacked up means that whole years seem to disappear into these memory sinkholes. Like, you know, the only thing you're measuring time with is like the changing heights of children. So that's why people say, my, look how much you've grown. It's like, because it didn't feel like two years since I saw that kid last. Anyway, all this sameness, we want to do at least some things that are going to give our brains something to hold on to. Memories are created when we do things that are novel, intense, out of the ordinary, a little bit outside of our comfort zone. That's what we have memories of. And the more memories we have of any given unit of time, the more thick and rich it feels as opposed to that is just disappearing. So one big adventure, one little adventure. This is kind of a compromise because I want people to have more adventures generally, but I also don't want to upset the good routines that exist. I don't want to exhaust anyone. I don't want to bankrupt anyone. One big adventure, we mentioned three to four hours, half a weekend day. One little adventure, less than an hour, can be doable on a weekday evening, you know, a lunch break, as long as it is out of the ordinary. And I find that when you start looking 
each week to have one big adventure and one little adventure, your mind shift just changes, right? Like your mindset is totally different. You are looking for adventures. You're on the hunt for fun things to do. Like you are feeling like an adventurous person, right? You're not just like, oh, what did we do this weekend? Nothing. I don't, you know, you have something to say, right? Like you're the person who always has that cool thing on Monday morning that you did over the weekend. And you just start creating a lot more memories. So it's not just, oh, that was a week like any other week. It's like, no, that's the week we went any golfing. That's the week we went hiking to see the fall leaves. That's the week that we, you know, tried that new Vietnamese restaurant, whatever it is, you know, that's a little bit adventurous that you can note and pay attention to. We just had a really good example of this that we all lived through in recent history when it comes to the pandemic and the early stages, especially of lockdown, where we had to break through that extreme sameness and monotony. Absolutely. And having this mindset of looking for adventures means that you are determined not to have that total sameness. And and even during the darkest days of the pandemic, there were some things we could do. I know my family would go for hikes on the weekend as our, our big adventure. We you know would go get takeout from somewhere as a, a little adventure. And I did my study in the spring of 2021. And a lot of people were sort of out of the worst restrictions at that point, but some people still had them. And, you know, People had to be creative. Like, what was your adventure? Maybe it was streaming a concert. You know, people weren't going to concert halls, but you could stream, you know, a concert from somewhere. Or, you know, it might be somebody created a shoots and ladders game on their driveway with chalk. You know, I just love that idea. But it's about being creative and taking your discretionary time seriously, right? That you want to figure out something cool to do with it instead of just kind of passively absorbing whatever happens to you. And I think that it even ties in a little bit to one of the other rules that I wanted to bring up, which is the effortful before effortless, because we're talking about adventures. Those things should be a little more leisurely. And so in that rule, you're talking about leisure activities and the difference between passive leisure versus active leisure. And I have an example that goes with big and little adventure, but I want to save it until we talk about what that rule really means. So effortful before effortless is about how we spend our leisure time. And and even the busiest people, as I was saying, you know, the, even the busiest people have some amount of leisure time. The problem is that for many of us, it comes in either sort of short spurts. They might be uncertain in duration. They can happen at low energy times, right? You know, at night after the kids go to bed or after you've done your work or chores. And so screen time fits all these constraints incredibly well. You can be on Twitter for two minutes or 20 minutes or two hours. It's kind of all the same, right? You know, it it doesn't make a whole lot of demands of you. Like you don't have to plan ahead to watch Netflix. And so because of that, this effortless fun tends to fill the bulk of people's leisure time. And there is nothing wrong with that per se. I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, don't watch TV, don't be on social media. I mean, there's a lot of great things on, on both of them. There really are. But at least in the abstract, most people would prefer to have a slightly different balance of their leisure time. People say they would love to read more. They'd like to spend more time on hobbies. They'd like to connect more with friends. And they would do these things if only they had the time. And then, you know, here we have our phones like once a week doing that screen time app thing, telling you you know, I've spent like three hours a day on your phone. You're like, where on earth did I find three hours in my day? And you, somehow it was there. I don't know. And so this rule is about trying to change the balance of our leisure time, which is that whenever a spot of leisure time opens up, challenge yourself to do a few minutes of effortful fun before effortless fun. So doing those things, those reading hobbies, connecting with friends before the screen time. So you're about to pick up your phone to check headlines, check social media, read an ebook for two minutes. All right. And then you can go be on social media as much as you want. At night, you've gotten the kids to bed, do a puzzle for 10, 15 minutes, and then go stream Netflix. And what happens here? One of two things happens. I mean, one is you get so into your effortful fun that you just keep going. You know, people get in their book. They want to find out what happens. They never wind up over at Facebook and that's fine because it'll still be there. <laughs> you know, whatever you want to go back. But the other thing, you know, even if you do wind up switching over, you read your ebook for two minutes and then you go on Twitter, is that you've gotten to do both. Like now you've had both kinds. It changes the balance. And, you know, I have have various statistics in the course of my book. But when I had people learn this rule, you know, I asked people various questions or had various statements and then people could strongly disagree, strongly agree. It was a one to seven point scale. One of those statements was yesterday. I did not waste time on things that weren't important to me. And Upon learning this rule, people's scores rose 32% on that question because they weren't spending as much of their time 
on the stuff that wasn't, you know, meaningful to them. They were doing more meaningful forms of leisure. And it's more that you notice it. When you're doing a Lego project, for instance, it's like planting a flag on the hill saying this is leisure time. Whereas if you pick up your phone, in your mind, it's not really counting for anything because it's like, well, I could be checking email or something, you know? So they were aware of it. And it, it just, you know, changed the entire perspective on the discretionary time that they had. Yeah, it adds this lens of perspective of intentionality to it. I love that you're talking about, I mean, you're, you're using the words effortful and effortless. I'm almost thinking of it as active versus passive. And I love that you say there's not really anything wrong with the effortless. It's good. It's got its place. But what I think is interesting is if you're saying start with effortful, often we think of something as effortful, but only in the first few moments is it really effortful to get it started. And then the momentum is going. Oh, I've got to go find my book. I've got to pick it up. I've got to figure out where I was. I need, I then need to find a spot. I won't be interrupted. It feels more frictionful <laughs> and effortful than effortless, but that's because phones are designed, one, we've always got them on us, and two, you pull it out and you're instantly down the rabbit hole, whereas the book, once you just get started, you're on the path and it's easier and fun to stay on the path. Yeah. And so this rule is about just pushing yourself over that tiny little bit of extra effort that it requires to start the effortful fun. Because, yeah, once you're doing it, like it is fun. <laughs> like these things aren't not fun. Like the reason people want to do them is that they are fun. And so the inherent pleasure of these activities tends to kick in and, and then many people just keep going. So. The way that I was thinking of this nine rule, effortful before effortless, and the way that it ties back for me personally to the one big adventure, one little adventure is kind of a hybrid of not only effortful and effortless, but then it also kind of moves into being a weekly medium adventure. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> so my family, we love our TV. We love watching TV. It's it's a passive thing. It's easy for us to slip into, et cetera. And I wanted to make it more of a communal and intentional activity. So kind of, again, in between the poles on both rules. And so I said, well, what if we start doing a weekly family movie night? And then we all get to collaborate. It's a little more intentional. We say, oh, we've never watched this series with the kids. They weren't old enough yet. And now they are. And so we intentionally pick which ones based on season, everybody has a say and we can kind of rank them and say, hey, we're, well, we did that. What's next? And by doing that and even setting aside a specific night of the week, we kind of hybridize it and make it a it's big and little. It's effortful because we're putting in thought and activity, but then we get to have an effortless activity that's effortful. And so as I was going through this, I thought, oh, my gosh, this kind of fits two rules and it's in the middle of both of them, weirdly. And that just goes to show that like there's wiggle room in here for all of these things to make it work for you. Absolutely. All of these are just suggestions. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you don't have to take any of my advice. I, I, I just thought think, they were you know, rules. We've got to follow the rules. Gotta Laura. Follow the rules. Well, you could call them strategies, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> I mean, I, I like rules, but, you know, not everyone likes rules. And if you don't like rules, then just, you know, call them ideas Laura came up with that worked for other people. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, I think anytime you have something that is intentionally chosen, you aren't not aware of the fact that you have this family movie night, right? Like, I mean, it, it's different from the sort of the leisure time that adds up without your even noticing the three hours on your phone in the course of the day that you didn't even, you can't even say what you were doing in that time. Like if you're aware of it, because it is a consciously chosen, you know, group decision on the movie, all watching it together, getting the snacks, getting in one place. Yeah, that's entirely different. So anything we can do with intentionality is going to wind up being a better use of time. And again, I, I think what you're getting at here with both those rules is this idea of, we have enough time. We're filling it with other things passively. Be more intentional with it, especially when it comes to Parkinson's law is what comes to mind is that work expands or leisure activities that are there, there's nothing wrong with expand to fill the time that you give it. And I'm, we're just saying and you're just saying be aware of the time you have and fill it first with these other things and then you won't miss the other things that didn't fill it. Exactly. There's a lot of low value time in many of our lives. And the question is, can we push higher value things into that time? And they'll just displace some of it. I mean, it's never gone entirely. Like everyone has some 
blah time, you know, for, for lack of a better word. But, you know, it's OK. We want to make sure that it's kept in its place. Mm-hmm. And again, there's there's this freedom here for the people that are like, oh, I, I can't stand structure. It's too much structure. I have to have an adventure every week. No, again, like you said, it's a suggestion, but it's a strong and healthy suggestion because, again, if you don't put any structure in place and have none and you're just free flowing and if that works for you, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. But if you just pause and again, look through that lens of intentionality at your calendar, then you might find, wait, I can actually do some really cool things here that I've never thought about doing. The possibilities actually exist. And I think most of the time we think they don't. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, just try it out. That's all I'm saying. Try it out. See if it works. If it doesn't, you can let it go. But, uh, you know, many other busy people have found benefits by trying these rules. So I'm guessing that you probably will, too. Yes. And that's a great point is that, again, you've had a lot of people have success with this. So you're sharing it. The other rule that I really wanted to hone in on that I think is very interesting because we've done different conversations on this show about setting goals and creating habits. It's number four, three times a week is a habit. What does that mean? Well, that things don't have to happen daily in order to be part of our lives and often can be more doable than always. I found that, you know, especially with busy people, there would be various things that they want to do in their lives, various high quality activities that they would berate themselves for not doing frequently enough. And that's because people tend to be looking at their lives in days. So, you know, let's say you want to learn Spanish and you're like, I'm going to practice my Spanish and the day is busy and you haven't practiced your Spanish. And you're like, oh, I'm horrible. I'm terrible. I'm a failure. That's one way to look at it. But what if you are doing it some? Like, what if you practice Spanish once in the past week? Okay, well, that's not none. It's not as much as I want, but it's not none. And there turns out to be a huge difference between not as much as I want and none. Not as much as I want suggests some good questions right there. Like, how can I scale this up? And so I'm saying if something happens three times a week, it is a regular part of your life. And it can be part of your identity. So if you discover you're saying, I want to practice my Spanish and you turn out to be doing it once a week or so, well, can you get to three? Probably you can. That's just about finding two extra spots. It's not requiring a total lifestyle overhaul. It's requiring finding like two short, you know, 20 minute, 15, 20 minute spots somewhere in the 168 hours of a week. It is very doable. And when things are doable, people do them. And then they can have this thing be a regular part of their lives. So it's about how we can do just a little bit more of whatever good activities we've decided we want to have be in our lives. When people talk about setting goals or creating habits, they're often presenting it as an all or nothing activity or practice that they're putting into place. I'm doing this thing and I'm not going to break the chain, Jerry Seinfeld, you know, like that lesson. And what you're saying essentially here is you can decide the frequency. Now, within reason, because if I say I'm going to practice this thing once a week, your skill level's not going to go up fast enough, possibly or probably, I would say, to keep you interested or feel like you're making progress. So that's where, again, three in a week is a really good number. And I was really like, you know what? This is exactly what I need for some of the things that are in my life habit wise that I need to do. And of course, I'm not going to add them all in at once, but I'm going (laughs) to pick one and start to do it three a week and then add others in as we go. Yeah, and the honest truth is that many times when people tell you they have a daily habit, they often don't. Like, you know, it means that they do something Monday through Friday. Somebody who goes to the gym every day after work tends to mean that they go Monday through Friday. They're not at the gym after work on Saturday and Sunday. They're probably not at work Saturday and Sunday. You know, it's just, so five times a week is what people think of as daily, even though it isn't, you know, that's not seven days a week, it's five days a week. And oftentimes people take off holidays and they take off vacations and they take off sometimes Fridays. Those don't make it into the daily category. So, you know, we're talking about doing things like four times a week and people are considering that a regular part of their lives. I was like, okay, well, let's, let's go with that then. You know, if we're doing it three to four times a week, you know, that's great. Let's aim for that from the beginning instead of having this fiction of it being every single day. Now, there are certainly things people do every single day and there are things people should do every single day. I mean, another one of my rules is to move by 3 p.m. And I'm saying you need to do some physical activity in the first half of every single day. But I'm just talking about like 10 minutes, you know, for something to be a truly daily habit. It has to be very, very small. It has to be something like brushing your teeth. 
right? Most people don't feel a huge amount of resistance to brushing their teeth. We're willing to have that be a habit more than three times a week. We'll, we'll, we'll do that daily. But if it's something that is less automatic, it's a little bit bigger, requires a little bit more effort, then we're better off looking at a couple times a week and seeing if we can do that and sticking with it than aiming for daily, not doing it, feeling bad about ourselves and, and just not sticking with the habit. Well, and I love that you brought up number three and the move by 3 p.m. because I was thinking this whole time of exercise and this whole, you know, those of us with lives and kids and relationships and all of this, we know that truthfully our schedule shifts. There are seasonal breaks and just progress that has to get done. We're recording this now in October and we've been now into the school year for a certain amount of time. And that's been a whole kind of shift from the summer and it happens every single time. And every time that happens, you know, I've got to figure out my physical activity and my habit and shifting it. And it didn't quite work this time, unfortunately. And yet when you brought up in the book, three times a week is a habit. I'm like, wait a second. That's why I've been beating myself up because I haven't been able to figure out making it daily every single day. And I realized, well, wait a second. I can do a air quotes, real workout three times a week, according to my schedule, I know right where to put it. And then when it was the move by 3 p.m. rule that was also in there, I thought, wait a second, on the days that I do the workout, that counts if it's before 3 p.m. And if it's a day that I can't do the workout because of schedule, I still have enough time to move by, say, taking the dogs out for a walk. So, yep, yep. And that's enough. That counts. That counts. That absolutely counts. Because it's more, yeah, that move by 3 p.m. rule is more about just, you know, getting a break in your day, about getting some physical activity, which will boost mood and energy. And I do this myself. You know, I'll see it's like 2.30 p.m. and I haven't done anything yet. And I get up and I go walk around outside and I just walk around the yard, walk around the, the neighborhood and come back after 10 minutes. And reliably, I feel better. Afterwards, I feel more energetic. I feel ready to, you know, approach whatever I was doing. It's like magic and it's so accessible. It's just one of those things. It's like we have the ability to, to put a total reset button in our days and people spend so much, you know, effort and money and time trying to make themselves happier and more energetic. And here we have this thing that will do it reliably. I mean, I would say like more than 90% of the time, if you go for a 10 minute walk, you come back feeling better. Like, you know, it's, it's so simple and yet we don't necessarily always do it. But when people actually did do it every day, their energy levels rose significantly and they felt better able to handle their responsibilities. I think the other key piece here that makes this all practical is these nine rules or suggestions, however you want to think about them, are not something that you should open up, go through and say, how do I apply all nine of these to my life immediately right now? You can have a different approach. You can apply it to your life, specifically your life in the way that best works by picking any specific one of them. And I think you probably have a suggested maybe where to start. Well, I put them in order. <laughs> There's one is called rule one. You know, I chose this order because I think it is a helpful order that first, you know, we get these basic building blocks of getting in charge of our time. So first giving yourself a bedtime because nothing works well if you are sleep deprived or, you know, if you are spending some days exhausted and other days, it's hard to maintain good routines because your body is forcing you to crash and make up the sleep. So getting the same amount of sleep the amount you need every single night changes your perspective on life entirely. So we want to do that first. And once we've done that, then it is easier to put ourselves in charge of other things. And then we plan on Fridays. This is about, you know, creating a holistic weekly planning practice where we focus on what's important and not just what's happening. And, you know, once we've sort of done that, it becomes easier to do the other things. Like you've got the landscape of your time so you can see where can I put in my 10 minutes of physical activity so I can move by 3 p.m. You start seeing where can I do those, you know, whatever habit I want to do three times a week because I've planned my week. So now I see what it looks like and where I can put those things and how I can create more open space you know, with our our backup slot and where can I put my adventures? And, you know, it, it's just, that's the order. So, you know, we, we get the foundation, then we put good things in our lives with our adventures, our take one night for you. That's another one. And then we spend less time on the things we don't want to do, right? Those are the habits about batching the little things and doing effortful before effortless. 
So that's that's the order. Now, obviously, if you would like to throw in effortful before effortless, you know, in week one, too, like, you know, it's something that seems like a good habit. You know, you'd like to try it. Like, go ahead. Like, you know, you don't have to do it like this. But this is an order that seemed to work for people. And so if you aren't sure what order to go in, the order in the book is a good one. Well, and again, it's personal. It's personalized. You've got to personalize it for yourself because anybody else, like I already talked about kind of my personal experience coming to these nine rules. It's going to be different for everybody else. And you're at different stages of these rules. Maybe you've already got, you know, take that one night for you already down. That's already done. I do that. You know, then you don't need to worry about that. You can move on, you know, earlier or later in the rules. It's all about where you find yourself at, but it's about taking that step. And again, putting those glasses on, looking through that lens of intentionality and making decisions that make the most sense for you practically. Absolutely. Yeah. People will probably find they're already doing some of the strategies, but you know, if you are, there's a bonus tip, like a bonus strategy in every chapter uh, that you can kind of take it to the next level. If you find that the first one is already a habit. Man, I don't have anything else to say. I just want to say, I think this is one of the easiest, most practical productivity books that's come out. And again, like I said, it's one of those things where you do something for so long, you do a show for so long. Is there anything new to say? I don't think any of what we just talked about is new per se, but it's a new perspective on the same old things that really bog us down and make us feel like we don't have time and don't have a life and start to get just mundane. So thank you, Laura. I'm really thankful for you writing this. This is a great book. Oh, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun to write. You know, some books are harder than others to write, but because I had done this project and had 150 people's experiences of trying out these rules, it's like it was so easy to write because I just used their answers, right? Like that just, you know, what challenges are you going to face? Well, here are challenges that 150 people faced. And so I can tell you about those and I can tell you about how they dealt with them. And so maybe you'll pick something up from those strategies. So it was, it was just such a joy to write. And it's my hope that it will be helpful for people and that they will feel like, you know, they can calm the chaos that's all around us and make time for what matters. Very thankful for those alpha and beta testers as well. <laughs> so let's point people to where they can find the book on your site. They can obviously find it everywhere else that I'll link up to in the show notes. But where can people find out more about what you've done, what you're doing? You've got a podcast, all that good stuff. Yeah, you can visit lauravandercam.com. That's just my name and my website. And there you can learn about all my books, which Eric so graciously listed at the first part of this podcast. You can learn about my podcast. I have one that's called Before Breakfast. That's a short every weekday morning tip. Just help take your day from great to awesome. It's four to five minutes. So you can listen to it while you're making your coffee, getting dressed, whatever you want. And then I have one that comes out every Tuesday with a friend of mine, Sarah Hart Unger. It's called Best of Both Worlds. And we look at issues of work and family from the perspective of people who really enjoy both. Perfect. Laura, great to have you back. Can't wait to have you back again. I know it'll happen. <laughs> I'll have to write another book, I yes. guess. <laughs> we'll see what it is. I'm curious. I don't know. Maybe we'll do it before then. Who knows? Because I'm sure there's still other stuff to unpack. So we'll see. But again, Laura, thank you so much for being here. Glad to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Laura Vanderkam like I did, like I teased in the prologue to the conversation. Isn't that kind of game-changing to think of a habit as something that you do three times a week instead of seven days a week or even once a week? Just thinking about it in terms of you have the flexibility to set the time frame and the timetable and the interval for a habit. You do. You have that power. You have that agency. And so if that gets you to the place of being consistent with a habit, lean in on that. And that's just one of the nine rules in this book. I know we didn't cover all of them. That's okay. We brought them all up briefly. It's a great book. I've linked up to it in the show notes. I've also linked to Laura's site as well as her podcast. You can find all those things in the show notes for this episode at beyondthetodolist.com. Also, if you didn't know, you can get shortcasts of Beyond the To-Do List episodes. What's a shortcast? Well, it's a short seven to 10 minute distilled down to its essence version of a podcast from my show over on Blinkist. I partnered with them to create those. All you need to do is either click the link in the show notes or go to beyondthetodolist.com slash Blinkist to check it out for free. If you enjoyed this conversation, I would love for you to do me the favor as well as somebody else that you know that needs to hear this conversation the favor of sharing it with them. 
Hit that share button in your podcast player app of choice. Let them know about it. Let them know why you thought of them. Do them that favor. Do me that favor. Thank you so much for sharing this episode. Thank you again for listening, and I will see you next episode.